This next video on equilibrium will really center on Le Chatier's principle, which is about a state of equilibrium that is disturbed. So I'll start this off by asking which of these pictures depicts equilibrium? And most of you might figure that it's the left one. The picture on the right where this last ball is raised and it's moving and it's about to knock into the other balls that are at equilibrium, that are about to be disturbed. Um, this underlies what the Chatier's principle is. So something at equilibrium gets disturbed. And then what we really want to figure out is which direction will the system move? And I think we understand the physics of this situation enough that we would know that when this ball hits these four, these four will first move away and then they will oscillate back and forth until they come to rest or at equilibrium again. Le Chatier's principle states, if a system is at equilibrium, is disturbed such that it is no longer at equilibrium, and this can be a disturbance that means a change in concentration or the reaction volume, pressure, or temperature, then the position of the equilibrium will shift in the direction that opposes the change. The most key word here is the word opposes. So whatever the change is, the system will shift in the opposite direction. This is an important principle because we will use it to predict and to understand how the position of the equilibrium shifts for each of these different types of changes. So previously, I showed you a flow chart where the key steps were you have an initial situation that's not at equilibrium, so Q does not equal to K, and then you reach equilibrium where Q equals K, and the important was to figure out how that changed, what reaction direction, how much would occur to get from initial to equilibrium. Now, these problems have an extra step. Initially, we are at equilibrium. We have Q equals K. But then this thunderbolt here is representing a disturbance. And this disturbance ensures that Q no longer is equal K. And when that happens, the system undergoes an internal change to again recalibrate, re-equilibrate back such that Q again equals K. Now these two equilibrium positions are different even though in both cases k has the same value. And that's because the specific concentrations will differ from the original ones because the conditions are now different. Maybe it's a new pressure or volume or temperature. So the Chatier's principle, again, can be stated as if a system at equilibrium is disturbed, then the system will shift in the direction that opposes the change in order to reach equilibrium. So here I've kind of color-coded to show you what the flow would be. So at, we have our initial equilibrium here in teal, and then there's a disturbance, and that's shown in orange. And because of this disturbance away from equilibrium, the system will change internally in a direction that opposes the change. Now, this is an unfortunate word because here this change actually means the disturbance. So you can think of this as the external change, whereas the shift is actually the internal change. And in the end of all this, we again reach equilibrium, but this has now a new position and therefore this new equilibrium still has the same value of K, but we represent it with a slightly different color. So to organize the rest of the lecture, we're gonna go through these main types of changes in concentration. 
I'm going to group pressure and volume together because they're interdependent on each other and temperature and catalyst. And for each type of change, we want to discuss and predict their effect on the position of the equilibrium and also the value of the equilibrium constant k. The questions we're going to address are how does the position of the equilibrium shift to changes in concentration of a reactant or product, in pressure or volume, or in temperature? And we're going to ask the same question for the equilibrium constant value. How is that value affected by the same changes described earlier? And you'll notice in all of this that I have not mentioned the word catalyst. This is sort of a special category that we will cover separately at the end of the video. The first of the changes that we'll discuss is concentration. So how does the position of the equilibrium shift to changes in the concentration of reactants and products? So I have a general equation here where A and B are my reactants and C is my product. So we'll cover each of the situations. And just for simplicity, I'll just cover one of the reactants A, but it will also be the same for reactant B. Um, so these arrows now represent the shift of the equilibrium. Does it shift towards C, represented by this green arrow, or does it shift towards the reactants, represented by this red arrow? Now remember, the response of the system, according to Le Chatis principle, is always in opposition to the external change. So if you add reactant A, if you increase A, then the system wants to respond by decreasing A. If you add reactant A, the equilibrium will shift toward product C. And if you add product C, the opposite will happen. The equilibrium will shift towards the reactants A and B. You can also change concentrations by removing reactants and products. So for instance, you can remove A or you can remove C. So if you remove A, the opposite would be that the reaction wants to form more reactants. And so the equilibrium would shift towards reactants. If you remove product, the equilibrium will shift to form more product. Now, how is the value of the equilibrium constant affected by these changes in concentration? And there is no effect. The only parameter that changes the value of K is temperature. In this next example, we'll discuss pressure and volume together. These are two interdependent changes. You can think back to the ideal gas law. If the volume is increased, the pressure will go down. And if the volume is decreased, the pressure will go up. So now I'm going to use some specific examples. So I have three equations here, and we're going to discuss for each one, how does the position of the equilibrium shift to an increase in pressure, which would be synonymous with a decrease in volume? In this first example, we have protons and chromium ions giving a dichromium ion and water. And so there is no shift. And that is because all these species are in solution. And pressure and volume changes do not affect solids or liquids. So none of these species will feel those changes in pressure or volume as much as a gas would. Now, the second example, all those species are gases. We have hydrogen plus iodine to give two molecules of HI. Now, the answer for this is also no shift. And the reason being that the moles of gas on both the left and the right side of this equation 
are balanced. And so there is no preference for either reactants or products in response to this increase in pressure or decrease in volume. In this last example here, again, we have a chemical reaction among gases, N2 plus three equivalents of hydrogen gives two equivalents of ammonia or NH3. And here we might expect a difference because there is different amounts of moles of gases on the left and right side. So an increase in pressure will actually shift the equilibrium to the right because there are fewer moles of gas. So when you increase the pressure of a system, the system will respond by trying to decrease that pressure. And the way it can do that is by reducing the number of moles of gas. And so here we have four moles of gas on the left side, but only two moles of gas on the right. And so if the equilibrium shifts to the right, then we get fewer moles of gas and we help re-equilibrate the pressure. Now, how does the position of the equilibrium shift if the total pressure is increased by adding inert gas like argon? So this is kind of a special category where you are changing the pressure of the total reaction, but the gas that you add does not participate. That's what inert means. It's just a bystander and it's not involved. In this case, there is also no shift because even though the total pressure changes, the partial pressures of those gases in the reaction actually do not change. And how is the value of the equilibrium constant affected by changes in pressure or volume? Again, no effect because temperature is the only parameter that affects the value of the equilibrium constant. Next, we want to predict how the position of the equilibrium will shift with respect to changes in pressure or volume. So we start here at initial equilibrium where we have three different gases, the reactants A and B in blue and orange and the product C in green, and decide which way we think the equilibrium will move if we change the volumes to either be smaller or larger. Now, pressure and volume are interdependent, but inversely related to each other. So the volume increases here from right to left, but the pressure increases in the opposite direction from left to right. So with respect to moles of gas, we would expect that when we increase the volume, or decrease the pressure, we basically have more room for more moles of gas. But if we decrease the volume or increase the pressure, we actually want to decrease the moles of gas. Moles of gas along these three pictures then will want to increase from right to left. So in this larger volume where we favor more moles of gas, the equilibrium will shift towards the reactants. But in the smaller volume where we want less moles of gas, the equilibrium will shift towards products. I want to emphasize that even though the position of the equilibrium is different in these three flasks, if we were to calculate the equilibrium constant value, they would be identical because pressure and volume changes do not change the value of K. In this next example, the reaction is A plus B joining together to form a new product, AB. And these two images below both illustrate the same reaction. And they are the same volume. But if you look closely, you might notice that they have different amounts of reactants and product. 
The question is, which picture depicts equilibrium? And this is a trick question. The answer here is both. And you might wonder, how is that possible? Um, because they would have two different equilibrium constant values. And that's because what I'm not showing you is that they're actually at two different temperatures. So unlike the other factors we've talked about, concentration, volume, or pressure, temperature is unique in that it can also change the value of K. Next, we want to predict how the position of the equilibrium will shift with respect to changes in temperature. And we'll look at it in both ways, upon heating and cooling. So here's an example reaction where I've also provided the enthalpy change in the reaction. And you'll notice that I've highlighted the sign of the delta H value. And this is important because both the equilibrium position and the value of the equilibrium constant will depend on whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic. If a reaction is endothermic, delta H is positive, and that means you need heat as an input to make the reaction go. So you can consider in that case that heat is a reactant. On the other hand, if a reaction is exothermic, and delta H is negative, the heat is being produced, and you can think of heat as a product. So in this example, because it's exothermic, heat can be written like it's a product. And if we remember back to concentration, if you add a product to a reaction equilibrium, then there, there will be an internal change that opposes that disturbance. So by heating this reaction, the equilibrium will want to move away from heat. And so we would expect that upon heating, we would shift towards reactants, but upon cooling, which is removing the product heat, we will shift the reaction towards products. We also want to know how the value of K is affected by changes in temperature, both for heating and cooling. For this analysis, I just want to remind you that K is a ratio of product over reactant. So we know in the case of heating that the equilibrium shifts to reactants. So that means the denominator in the KC expression will be getting larger, and therefore the KC value will go down. The opposite is true for cooling. Upon cooling, the equilibrium position shifts to products. In the KC expression, products is in the numerator. So if the numerator goes up, the K value will as well. So these two are intimately tied together. And you can first figure out where the position of the equilibrium will shift and then what that means to the value of K special relationship between the equilibrium constant K and temperature is given by the Van Hoff equation shown here. On the left side, we have the natural log of two different equilibrium constants, and these equilibrium constants are at two different temperatures, T2 and T1. You'll see that besides the ideal gas constant, the only other parameter left is the delta H of the reaction. This equation is useful for two different things. Let's say you want to solve for delta H of the reaction, and you have two different equilibrium constants at two different temperatures. Or let's say you know one equilibrium constant at a specific temperature and the delta H of the reaction, and you want to solve for the equilibrium constant at a different temperature. This equation may look very similar to one that we saw earlier in the kinetics chapter because it's a very similar relationship between little k, which is the rate constant, and temperature. And so here's that equation again where we have the activation energy in addition to the ideal gas constant. 
Now, these may not look perfectly similar in the sense that it's missing a minus sign in of the different positioning of T2 and T1. But if you were to factor in a minus sign out of this expression and put it out here in front of EA, you would obtain this equivalent expression in which now you can see these are both nicely matched. So this brings us to the next part where there is actually a very nice innate connection between equilibrium constant and delta H that's matched by the relationship between the rate constant and the activation energy. The reaction energy diagram is a nice way to illustrate the relationship between delta H and the equilibrium constant, as well as activation energy and the rate constant. The y-axis is potential energy. The x-axis is the reaction progress where reactants are converted into products and they do so by going through this path in yellow where they have to overcome this activation energy barrier to the transition state before they can proceed to products. And again, delta H is just the difference in enthalpy between reactants and products. And as drawn here, uh, this is an exothermic reaction. So kinetics has taught us that the activation energy affects how fast the reaction reaches equilibrium. And that means the rate constant value, or little k. But Ea does not affect the equilibrium value. On the other hand, the change in enthalpy affects the percent conversion in the reaction, or how much the reaction will progress to products. And this is also captured by the equilibrium constant k. But delta H does not affect the reaction rate. So what's neat about the potential energy diagrams, it shows how these two types of energies, Ea and delta H, are at a dichotomy. Ea affects the rate constant K, and delta H affects the equilibrium constant uppercase K. Finally, we can now address the question of what is the effect of adding a catalyst on the equilibrium constant K? As a reminder, a catalyst speeds up the reaction by changing the mechanism so to lower the activation energy. So in this reaction energy diagram, we're comparing an uncatalyzed reaction in green versus the purple path, which is the one with the catalyst that allows us not only to change the mechanism, but also to lower the barrier for reactants to move to product. So what is the effect then of catalyst on the equilibrium constant K? The answer is no effect, because even though this purple path is distinctly different from the green path, their starting and ending points are exactly the same. And so the delta H of a reaction doesn't change upon the addition of a catalyst. And because catalysts do not perturb delta H, they do not change either the equilibrium position or the value of the equilibrium constant. What they do change is just how fast the reaction will reach equilibrium.